Okay, can you hear me? Okay, uh, <clears throat> thanks very much for uh, for coming again. Um, I'm happy to be to be back and uh, to see all of you in uh, in good shape. I'm sure you couldn't wait. Good. So um, the first part of the um, of the course, we we went through or over. Um, a few techniques to analyze the uh, spectra of, uh, of random matrices. Uh, you remember one of the um, one of the main points I insisted a lot was this uh, Lehman uh, classification of random matrix uh, models, where we have this, uh, if restricted to matrices with uh, real spectrum, uh, the two main classes that we can consider are those with uh, independent entries. Um, and uh, those with uh, rotationally, rotational invariance. And um, I told you that there is only one, uh, as a consequence of the Rosenzweig and Porter theorem, there's only one class of ensembles in the, in the intersection, which is the uh, Gaussian uh, ensemble in, uh, in its three, um, three declinations. Uh, real symmetric, complex Hermitian, and quaternion self-dual matrices, which are uh, basically indexed uh, via the uh, Dyson's, uh, Dyson's uh, index equal to be, um, called beta, equal to one, two, or or four. Now today uh, and this uh, this week, I wanted to go over a, a, a class of techniques which um, basically, uh, in essence. Uh, we can group under the name uh, Edwards Jones um, formulas. Um, so, this class of uh, techniques is, in principle, uh, useful or valid for any matrix here. So, it is, it is incredibly general in principle. In, um, in practice, uh, it is not. But it's nevertheless um, mainly useful for uh, matrices in this in this class, for example, for independent entries uh, matrices, uh, which is the case where we have very few um, very few other weapons to uh, to tackle. So this this offers us a, a good way to deal with problems in that side of, of the on that side of the of the diagram. So in general, the, uh, the goal of this class of um, techniques is the following. We can write it as um, we want to connect the um, joint probability density of the entries of a random matrix model. Let's call it uh, P of x11 xnn. So this is our input, the input of the formula, which can be anything. It can be very general. It can lie anywhere on this, on this diagram. Uh, with another object, which is the, we discussed extensively, uh, with the average uh, spectral density, an object that we denoted, um, I think, rho n of lambda in uh, in the first the first week so this would be the output okay so we are trying to connect uh, two two words uh, the input is the joint probability density of the entries and the output should be the average spectral spectral density so in principle uh, one would like to establish the following uh, chain if possible so from the input, the joint probability density of the entries, where the number of variables is of order n square, we would like to reduce this number of variables by considering the joint probability density of the eigenvalues, which gives full information about, uh, about the spectrum. Here we have, let's say, a reduction in complexity. We go to order n um, variables, and then from here, we would be, in principle, able to compute our uh, output because we know that the average spectral density is the marginal 
we, we used this property uh, a lot uh, in the past week. So we could basically integrate over all eigenvalues but one, and we would get from the joint probability density of the eigenvalues to the average spectral density. Okay? Unfortunately, we, uh, we know that the, the first step of this, of this chain is not, not always possible. Okay? Why it is not always possible to carve out uh, from, from the joint probability density of the entries the joint probability density of the eigenvalues? Well, we know that the uh, integration over eigenvectors cannot be always computed in closed form. So in some sense, the Edwards-Jones uh, formula and, and its uh, relatives allow, um, allows us to bypass this step entirely. So to go directly from the joint PDF of the entries to the average spectral density without knowing or without the need to compute the joint PDF of the eigenvalues. So in some sense, it's, it's, it's a quite powerful um, tool because it, it, it doesn't require this step that we know can be very difficult or in, in some cases, in most cases, even impossible. Okay, so let me give you, without wasting further time, can I erase here? So I will first give you the, um, the formula. So, and then we try first to prove it, and then to see why it can be, uh, how it can be used. So the formula reads as follows. So the spectral density is equal to, let me get this uh, straight, uh, minus two over pi n, um, the limit epsilon to zero plus the uh, imaginary part of the derivative with respect to lambda of the average of the logarithm of something where this uh, z of lambda can be written as a multiple integral over auxiliary variables y it's an n-fold integral of the form exponential minus i over 2 y transpose lambda epsilon identity minus x into y. So lambda epsilon is lambda minus i epsilon and the vector y is a column vector of auxiliary variables. Yeah? What do you mean? Well, I define Z of lambda as this, where <coughs> lambda epsilon is in here. Okay, so um, here we have basically a full calculus course in one single formula. So we have a multiple integral, we have a logarithm, we are taking the average, where the average here is taken with respect to the joint PDF of the entries. Okay, so recall that this one, this object here, is our only input. This is the only thing that we know. 
And then we have this, this multiple integral, which contains the entries of our random matrix in, in here. Okay? In principle, if we, we, we compute this integral for lambda epsilon, so lambda minus i epsilon, then this would give the average spectral density at the point lambda. Now the um, the proof of this uh, the proof of this formula. Um, well, can I can I raise here, so I can keep I can keep the formula there. Good. So f first uh, remark. So while the, the, the formula is in principle valid as, as written, for finite n, it is in practice used or usable in the uh, limit of large matrix size where several simplifications take place. Okay, so the um, the proof starts from uh, the definition of the average spectral density as the average over the ensemble of 1 over n, summation i 1 to n, delta of lambda minus lambda i. So this is the first, the first ingredient, just the definition of the spectral density. And then the second ingredient is the famous Sochotsky and Plemel formula that we used already in our lecture on the, on the resolvent. Okay? So the sochotsky plemel formula reads Remember, we have this in the, in the notes. So why is this, uh, this object, uh, this, this identity, interesting? Uh, well, first of all, it justifies the presence of this limit here. Um, it is interesting because it provides uh, an, inter an interesting representation of the delta, of the delta function. Okay? So we can now trade this delta function using this, this relation. So we can rewrite rho n of lambda as what? As 1 over pi, so we need to kill this pi. Then we need to kill, we need to add this n, 1 over pi n. Then we will have limit epsilon to 0 plus the imaginary part of what? So basically, I'm taking, instead of using the delta function, which was here, I'm using this rational function here, but I will need to take the imaginary part of it in the limit epsilon to zero. Okay? So the, the net effect of, of this is that I don't have any more a delta function in there, and I replaced it with a rational function. Okay? I'm just trading uh, a delta for a rational function. So this, this explains a few of the terms that you see in the final, in the final formula, the imaginary part and the limit. Now we, we need to see how to get the remaining, the remaining bits in the game. 
Okay. Um, so first of all, I can uh, uh, change just the sign here. It's not really important, but just for convenience. So I'm just changing the sign here. Okay, now if you if you compare this bit with the with the final formula I gave you there, you see? So we, we got here. If you compare here, you see that basically the only step that is missing is to interpret this rational function one over something as the derivative of a logarithm. Right? So this is what we are what we are going to do. The only problem, I mean, the only thing that we need to be uh, a bit more careful about is that this object is a complex, is a complex number. Okay. So we will need to be a bit more careful on how to deal with logarithms of, of complex numbers. That's why I wrote a log with a capital, with a capital L here. Um, well, now I'm forced to erase this. You have it in your notes, right? Two minutes tutorial on complex logarithms, just as a, as a reminder. So the, the logarithm of a complex number is the number w such that the exponential of w is equal to z. This just by definition. So the, the problem that we face is that the logarithm, sorry, the complex exponential is not uh, injective on, on, the, on the whole complex plane because it does not map distinct values to distinct values. For example, if you take exponential of w plus 2 pi i, this is still equal to exponential of w. So in order to define uh, the logarithm, which is the inverse function, we need to restrict the domain of our function. Okay? Otherwise, we would get a multivalued function which is what the, what the logarithm is. So, so the, the solution to this problem is to restrict the domain of the exponential function to a region that does not contain any two numbers differing by an integer multiple of 2 pi i. If you do so, 
we get that for any complex number we can define, so z will be x plus i y, so we can define the so-called principal value that we call log z with a capital log as the logarithm whose imaginary part lies in the interval minus pi pi. Now, the, uh, the only problem that I wanted to, um, you know, flag and make you more aware of is that not all the familiar properties of the real logarithm So not all the familiar properties of the real logarithm carry over to the complex log. For example, and these two will be, will be handy, if you take the principal logarithm of exponential of z, this may not be just equal to z. And also, the principal value of the logarithm of z1 times z2 may or may not be equal to log of z1 plus log of z2. So we need to be a bit more um, careful on, on this. Uh, as an exercise, if, if you don't believe it, I ask you to compute log of minus 1 times i, which will give minus pi i over 2. And if you compute log of minus 1 plus log of i, this will give 3 pi i over 2. So just, just keep these potential uh, problems in, in mind. Anyway, we can still Can you read here, in the back? So we can still write the object that we had was summation i1 to n of 1 over lambda i plus i epsilon minus lambda, which will be the derivative with respect to lambda of summation i1 to n logarithm of lambda i plus i epsilon minus lambda with probably a minus sign in front. Okay. So the, the, the property of the derivative will be the same. These properties might, might be different. Okay. So we can, now we have explained the reason why we've got a, a derivative with respect of lambda into the, the formula that I gave you. 
but it is still not clear why we are doing all of, all of this, right? Uh, the the pr problem is, suppose that the point, suppose for a moment that this log was just a normal standard real logarithm, okay? Then we would have summation over i of a logarithm of something. Summation of a logarithm, we can, we can trade the summation for a product, so we, we could, in principle, write this as logarithm of a product. And now, what would, would this product be? So it will be the product of lambda i plus i epsilon minus lambda. So it is the product, morally, of eigenvalues, right? So what is the product of eigenvalues? So it's a determinant, right? So if, if this logarithm was real, we could trade summation of a logarithm for a logarithm of a product, and this product would be a determinant. Now, logarithm of a determinant. And now you know that a determinant to some power, for example, minus one half, can be written in terms of a multiple integral. So this, this would be the logic that would land onto this multiple integral that we call z of lambda. Okay, so this, this would be the, the idea. Summation of a log is equal to log of a product is equal a log of a determinant. This determinant can be represented as a multiple integral, and then we are done. You see the, you see the logic. Unfortunately, we need to be a bit more careful due to, this, um, to, due to the fact that this logarithm is not real. Okay? So the summation of principal logarithm is not necessarily equal to the product of principal logarithms. This property here, okay? which is clear, because if the argument of this object must be between minus pi and pi, and the argument of this object must be between minus pi and pi, this doesn't mean, doesn't necessarily mean, that the sum of two arguments between minus pi and pi will be between minus pi and pi, right? Okay, it is still true, though, that we can write a multiple integral representation. Um, can I remove uh, here? Huh? You have it in your notes. Good. So we can still use, well, we call it, we call the object z of lambda. So this would be the integral over R n of d y. So when I write this ball face, uh, ball face y, I really mean the product of d y one up to t d y n of exponential of minus i over two y transpose lambda epsilon identity minus x. So now. This is um, an exercise for you. I'll just give you the exact result of this uh, integral. You can check it with Mathematica if you want. So this is a sort of correct version of the identity for the determinant in terms of a multidimensional integral. So normally, we would have here no complex variable. We would, we would have just a Gaussian integral, okay? exponential of minus 1 half, let's say, of y transpose a certain matrix A times y. And here on the right-hand side, apart from, from constants in, in front, we would have 1 over the square root of the determinant of A. Okay? Now here, the problem is that this, this object is not really a Gaussian integral, because we've got complex variables, complex values uh, all over the place. So more, to be more precise, this would be what is called a multidimensional Fresnel integral, 
And this matrix here is a, a weird object because it is a complex symmetric matrix. So if H is real symmetric, this object basically alters the diagonal with a complex number. So it is still a real symmetric matrix, but with the diagonal formed of complex number. So this is not an Hermitian matrix. It's a, it's a complex symmetric. And here, on the right-hand side, we have some sort of 1 over square root of the determinant because we have the exponential of a logarithm with a minus 1 half in front. So this would be morally, if, if, you, if, you, if you took this logarithm as a, as a real logarithm, this morally would be 1 over the square root of the determinant. Except that written in this form, there are no ambiguities because this is the principal logarithm and this is the exponential, the complex ex exponential. Okay, so that's an exercise for you on how to prove this identity. Okay, now we are almost there. Why? Because this object here is the chunk that we need for our formula. So if we manage to extract this chunk from this formula and replace it in, in here, our formula will be, our proof will be uh, complete. Do you agree? You want a coffee? Either you agree or you don't agree. So just, you agree? Yes. OK. So how would you imagine that all these logarithms were real logarithms? How would you extract this chunk from this formula? We have some, some integral e equal to exponential of something that we want. Yeah, you would take the logarithm, right? Except that I told you that the logarithm of exponential to z may not be equal to z. Well, it depends, it depends on the argument of z. So it, it may be equal, depending on the argument of z, or it may not be equal, so it may differ from this object by a certain multiple, for example, 2 pi i or something. Okay? So we cannot be sure that this, that this equality will be true. But it is still true if we apply the logarithm on, on both sides. We can still write summation i1 to n of the logarithm principal logarithm of lambda i plus i epsilon minus lambda will be equal to what? Suppose that we take this, this logarithm, will be equal to what? There is a factor minus one half that will go on this side as a minus two. So this will be equal to minus two, the principal logarithm of z of lambda plus a certain number of terms. And here, what saves us is this. Remember that in the formula, we will have to take the derivative with respect to lambda. So whatever other terms we have there, these terms will be killed So in some sense, the difference between the real logarithm and the complex logarithm become ineffective or less effective due to the fact that we, we have to take this, this derivative with respect to lambda, which will, will kill extra phases that might arise from, from, this, from taking this logarithm. Hmm. So now, uh, this minus two, minus two explains the minus two in the final formula. Okay, that's, that's the origin of it. So you can just then write, if you collect all the terms, rho n of lambda will be minus 2 over pi n, which is exactly what, what we had in the, in the formula, uh, limit epsilon to 0 plus, which comes from the sokolsky uh, Fleming formula, the imaginary part again. Then we have the derivative with respect to 
of lambda, and then we have the average over the ensemble of the logarithm of this multiple integral. Okay, so the the proof is uh, is complete. Now, what we need to understand is whether this um, this formula can be useful or or not. Okay. So clearly, the the crucial object is is this object here because we need to take the average over the distribution of the entries of our matrix of the logarithm, the principal logarithm of a multiple integral. Now, if we write it explicitly, what we are really after is the following. So let's write it explicitly. This would be the integral over the entries let's say the entries in the upper triangle of the probability of x11, xn, n, which is our input, remember, this is the only thing that we know. This is the only thing that we know about our ensemble. There are no, there's no other information. And then we have inside the integral the logarithm of what? Of this multiple integral. Do we agree? So that's, that's the ob object. Given our input, which is only the joint distribution of the entries, that's the object that we should, in, in practice, compute. So here we have this average. And here, inside here, we have the entries of our matrix. Now, uh, this is what, uh, what it is. But of course, if, if, if this was our final uh, final situation, our final point, this, this would be lethal, right? So it would be the end, the end of it. Why? Well, because, of course, the only way to, th there is this logarithm in the way, which is inside the integral. So we have a multiple integral of a logarithm of another multiple integral. So how do you, do you proceed with, with this? The only, the only thing you could do would be to compute this inner integral inside the argument of the logarithm, then try to massage it a bit, and then perform the, the second integral. Okay. But if you do this, then basically what, what you would do is you would run the Edward Jones formula backwards. Right? So in the end, if, if you did this, you would get the identity rho n of lambda equal to rho n of lambda, which is hardly useful. Right? Good. So uh, this, this is like an obstacle that we need to, to solve. So the only way forward would be if we were able to carry out the integration over the x's before the integration over the y. So if we were able to exchange the order of the two integrations. Otherwise, we would be running the formula backwards. Now, how do you exchange these two integrals having a logarithm in the way, in between? That's the main technical, the main technical challenge. OK, this brings us to uh, the two strategies. So just a bit of uh, um, jargon. So this average here over the joint distribution of the entries is called in the literature average over the disorder. So the disorder means the randomness, which is in the matrix entries. So when you read average over the disorder, you are just meaning this. We are taking this integral over the joint distribution of the entries of whatever, whatever it takes. 
Good. So there are two ways to overcome this um, obstacle. I'll just tell you this, and then we. Um, oh, I erased it. Uh, it was was it fine? Well, it, need, yeah. it needs to be. So there are two possible strategies. Which corresponds to, well, let's, let's call it like the annealed, so an averaging over annealed disorder or an average over quenched disorder. I'll try to explain you the way I understand this. So first a bit from the uh, dictionary. So it's quench or quenched. So this means from the dictionary like made less severe or intense, subdued or overcome, and then there are several other synonyms. For example, you can quench a fire, you can quench your thirst, you know, it, it, it gives the, the idea of something that is, that is sudden. Okay. You're just, you, you've got something erupting and you just quench it. To anneal is a, is a metallurgical term which means to heat metal or glass and allow it to cool slowly. In order to remove internal stress. and toughen it. OK, so now one hour lecture on metallurgy. No, first the break. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Can we start again? Good. So we have uh, these two terms, which apparently mean nothing, until I will explain it. Good. So remember the the problem that we are facing is the following. We have one multiple integral okay. 
So we have one multiple integral of the logarithm of another multiple integral over, let's say, dynamical variables y running over um, Rn. Um, and this object here, we call it uh, Z of lambda. So whenever I use the letter Z, well, this is intentional, right? So I could have called it in many different ways, but calling it Z reminds you of what? Yeah, so we use Z always for partition functions, right? So if you, if you forget for a moment the fact that we have complex numbers all over the place here, this is an, a multiple integral of an exponential of something. Okay. So we would like to interpret this object as an e so we are integrating over all degrees of freedom of an exponential of something. Okay. So it is tempting to interpret this object, modulo the fact that we have complex numbers in, in there, as a sort of canonical partition function where we are summing over all degrees of freedom, which corresponds to a sort of Gibbs-Boltzmann distribution of the type P of Y1, Yn. So this is, the, let's say, the distribution of positions or degrees of freedom of an associated thermodynamical model, which is in equilibrium at inverse temperature 1, let's say, and with a Gibbs-Boltzmann distribution of this type. So here's the total energy. And this depends on y, the uh, degrees of freedom, on x, which is our random matrix, and on lambda. Okay. So if, if you forget the complex nature of, of this object which stays here, it would be tempting to interpret this object as the integral over, let's say, all the positions or all the degrees of freedom of an object of, which is distributed according to exponential or minus something. Okay. And now, if we take the logarithm of this object, which is a partition function, then what, what do we get? Yeah, so, so here, basically, what, what this uh, formula suggests is that we are basically averaging the free energy of an associated thermodynamical system over the disorder. So you have a free energy corresponding to an Hamiltonian, which includes a term that is random. So inside the Hamiltonian, we have the disorder coming from the, the randomness of the matrix entries. OK. So <coughs> here we have, if, if we interpret this object this way, then we are basically taking two different averages, right? So we are taking an average here over the Boltzmann distribution. So average over the Boltzmann distribution. And here, we are taking the average over the disorder. Right? So we have two conceptually different things that we are doing. An average over the Boltzmann distribution of the free, and then, which, then we take the free energy, and then we average the free energy over the disorder. So this, this means that if we perform this operation the way it should be done, so by taking this, into this object, taking the logarithm and averaging over the disorder, well, this is equivalent to considering that the two level, so I write it down, the two, let's say, levels 
of randomness. So act on, let's say, different time scales. What does it mean? So first, first, the, let's say, dynamical variables Y thermalize for a fixed value of the random matrix X. So for a fixed, let's say, instance, So for a fixed instance of the disorder. So we take one instance of the disorder, we let your system thermalize, okay? and then you change your, the instance of your disorder, you let the system thermalize, and then you take the average of, of all. Okay? So it means that the dynamical variables, Y, are thermalizing, because we are averaging the free energy. So this is an equilibrium problem. Once they have thermalized for a fixed value of the instance of your random matrix, you change the instance. You draw another instance, you let the system thermalize, and then you take the average of the free energy over the different instances of the disorder. Okay? That's, that's the picture that you should have in mind. This corresponds, which is the right way to proceed, because this is an exact formula that we obtained, so that's, that's the way it is. So this corresponds to taking the so-called quenched average so the disorder is is fixed there is one instance that is fixed you let the system of of the y's thermalize at this fixed value of the disorder and then you average over the disorder good so this is this is what is called a quenched average what is the, this is the correct way to, to proceed. Unfortunately, it is quite complicated because we, are still, we still have the problem of having to exchange the two orders of integrations to get something meaningful. Otherwise, we are stuck. We, we, we would just be running the, the formula backwards. So this is correct, but difficult. Now, there is another strategy, which is the so-called annealed strategy. Uh, and this interpretation that I gave you uh, makes it maybe more clear what we are trying to do. So the annealed strategy, so if you treat the disorder as annealed, well, basically what you are assuming that the associated statmec uh, model is <coughs> described in terms of the joint set of variables x and y. So you are not picking one instance of your randomness, equilibrate your Y system, and then pick another instance of your X variables, equilibrate your system, and then taking the average. Instead, what you are doing is, is assuming that X and Y fluctuate together, so on the, same, on the same time scale. So you have, basically what you have, is certain partition of lambda which will be basically the integral over x, your random variable, and y together. So this is not the, 
the object that we should compute. The object that we should compute is this one. But if we make this, let's say, approximation that x and y fluctuate together, can you tell me what is the effect on that integral there? So how are we approximating that integral there? What is the operation that we are doing there? Or better, we, we probably take the logarithm out, right? So in doing this interpretation or this approximation is tantamount to removing the logarithm from inside the integral and taking the logarithm of the partition of the annealed partition function, which where you are integrating simultaneously over x and y's. Okay. So this uh, I find it very ironical because this is something that when you were when you were maybe 19 or 20, pulling a logarithm outside the integral would have costed you a fortune, right, with your teachers. True? Now we are promoting this incredible mistake <laughs> to a fantastic trick. OK? Good. So basically, we are revolutionizing the math. So what is a widespread to uh, a way to describe this operation? So sometimes uh, in, uh, in textbooks, you find this expression. So instead of, uh, of taking the average of log of z, you take the log of the average of z. where, in, in essence, this is not really true, because you are not taking this object here. What you are taking is the logarithm of the annealed partition function. So there is, no, there is no average of the disorder left, because you have just promoted the disorder as the dynamical variable. You agree? So now x and y are on the same footing. Okay, so this is this is an approximate way to to proceed, which stems from a mathematical mistake, if you want. The problem is that it it often works. It works uh, fa fabulously well, uh, as I'm going to um, to describe to you. So although it is not really uh, great from the mathematical point of view, it can still uh, give you some, uh, some information on your, on your random matrix model. Furthermore, the uh, computation is much easier, okay? because you don't, you don't have this problem of having a logarithm in, in the way anymore. You're just kicking him out. Okay. So I wanted to show, actually, a, a top to bottom calculation. Yes? That's, well, that, that's, that's hard to tell. I mean, uh, at, at, this, at this stage, I would, I would rather skip this, this question and duck it and, uh, and just consider it as a, as a mathematical, mathematically improbable way to get the true results, if you allow me to, if you allow me this. Okay? The question was, what is the physic in terms of our of our problem? What is the physical interpretation of the annealed approximation? Okay. Good. So now I will apply this formalism to uh, a case where we don't actually need it.
So we can do like a quick and dirty calculation as the uh, annealed calculation for uh, GOE. So we can carve out the semicircle in a few in a few steps. Okay. Mm. Obviously, in general, we don't need the Edwards Jones formula for Gaussian ensembles. Why? So the Gaussian ensembles are here. So we've, we've got our full arsenal available, right? We've got orthogonal polynomials, we've got the resolvent, we've got many, many different tools at our disposal, okay? But just as, uh, as an exercise, we can try to recover the semicircle from the Edwards-Jones formalism in the annealed approximation, okay? So we are not averaging the logarithm, we are just exchanging the order of integrations between y and, and h, carry out all the integration, take the log at the very end, and then we will see that this, uh, this gives the correct solution. Okay. And then my plan was the next, uh, the next lecture to try to do the, the full quenched calculation using replicas. Again, for the GOE case, again, a case where we don't need to do any of, of this, but just as a training training ground to see how this, this, um, this type of calculations are carried out top to bottom, okay? So uh, <clears throat> the idea is that we start from the joint distribution of the entries of our GOE. Now, by now, you should be able to uh, write it down yourself. Diagonal elements, and I have rescaled, I have just rescaled the variance uh, So I have rescaled the uh, the variance by uh, one over n to uh, to ensure a good limit for a uh, large n. Otherwise, we would have to rescale the eigenvalues by uh, one over square root of n. Okay? Good. So, what is the, uh, for the annealed calculation, so we need to compute the annealed partition function, which is what? Well, it is the integral over uh, degrees of freedom y. So remember that the logarithm has been kicked out of the way. Now we are treating y and the disorder on the same footing. Okay? So they are thermalizing together. Then we take the logarithm, so we have the free energy of the joint system, and then we apply the Edwards-Jones uh, formula. So we have to... And then we have an integral over the, um, the variables in the uh, upper triangle times the joint PDF of the entries, which is this, this object here. And then we have the exponential of minus i over 2 y transpose lambda epsilon the identity minus x times y. So that, this is the object we should, we should compute. Before we had this integral of, of what? Of the logarithm of this other integral. But, but we, just, we just kick the logarithm out of the way. Good. So we can, ignoring uh, some uh, prefactors here, anyway, we are interested in the, in the larger limit, we can pull this you know, this fir first term uh, outside, because it does not depend on the xij. 
So this will be the integral over dy over r to the n of what? Of exponential of minus i over 2 lambda epsilon, no, i over 2 lambda epsilon, and then we have summation um, i 1 to n y i square. Okay, so I'm taking this diagonal diagonal term, this is, this is a column vector. So this is minus i over 2 lambda epsilon, summation over i, y i square. And then we have the product of the averages over the diagonal entries and the off-diagonal entries. So I can write this as the average of exponential. There is a minus and minus plus. So i over 2 summation i 1 to n x i i y i square. So, and the, the average is taken over the diagonal entries. They are all independent. So, we can factorize the integral. And then we have the average over the off diagonal entries, which is e to the i summation i smaller than j x i j y i y j. So this is the average is taken over diagonal uh, entries, and this is taken over off diagonal entries. So now we can perform uh, these averages, keeping in mind that we want the large and, and limit, so we can be a bit um, quicker, a bit sloppier, if you want. So that's, that's the average that we need to do for the diagonal entries and for the off-diagonal entries. You have them in your notes, right? So I can erase. Good. So uh, we first use the expansion of the exponential, uh, 1 plus z plus z squared over 2 plus, so these are the ingredients to make a quicker uh, calculation. Is everything all right? And, and then we use the fact that uh, the average of xij is equal to 0. So these are Gaussian random variable with mean 0. And the average of xij squared, so the second moment, is 1 over n times 2 minus delta ij. So depending on depending on whether i is equal to, to j, we have a, a variance 1 over n or 1 over 2n. So now we can perform the average over the di diagonal entries, for example, exponential i over 2, summation i 1 to n, x i i, y i square. So this is the this is the average here. So we have the exponential of a sum. We can rewrite it as <coughs> product i1 to n of the exponential of i over 2 uh, x i i y i square. And then uh, all, all of these uh, variables are independent, so we can put the, the product outside of the average, right? So we can write product i 1 to n, and then expand the exponential like this. So you will get 1 plus i over 2 x i i y i square minus 1 eighth uh, x i i square y i to the fourth plus, and so on and so forth, which, well, I would really like to keep this one, but I can erase this one. So then we can take the average term by term by term. So the average of 1 is 1, the average of xii is 0, and the average of xii square is given here. So in, in summary, what we get 
is that this object is roughly speaking the product i1 to n of exponential minus 1 over 8 n y i to the fourth. Why? Because I just, you know, I just rewrote this was a product over i of 1 minus 1 over a to the n y i to the fourth. And I just re-exponentiate this, this object. As long as we are interested in the large n limit, we are making a neg negligible in, uh, error on this approximation. OK, and similarly, so this was for the diagonal part. So similarly, for the off-diagonal part, uh, I leave it uh, to you as an exercise. We get product i1 to n exponential of minus 1 over 4n uh, y i, uh, sorry, this was an exponential of, I need to correct this one. Okay, so we have uh, our two results that we need to plug into this expression, right? So we plug this object in here, we plug this object in, in here, and then we have to perform the integration over y. <coughs> okay? Uh, now, have you copied everything? Can I erase? Okay. So if I put these two results together here, just after a few couple of steps, I can rewrite this object as exponential minus 1 over 8n summation i and j, so without i different from j, y i square, y j square. Or, in a form that is a bit better, summation over i, y i square all to the square. So I'm just I'm just putting uh, this object, multiplying it by this object, and then symmetrizing because this product is is over i smaller than j, and then I'm symmetrizing. Okay, so you get the factor of two that you that you need here to rewrite this object in this form. Okay. So in the end, you have your beautiful integral. Compute your beautiful y integral which gives you the annealed partition function, uh, ignoring uh, constants, of, of course. So keeping only the leading exponential term, dy exponential of minus i over 2 lambda epsilon summation over i y i square, which came from, from here. And then we have this exponential here. So we have times exponential of minus 1 over 8n summation over i, y i squared, all squared. OK, now we would like to perform this uh, y integral. And as you can see, here we have a uh, an annoying term because we have a sum of the integration variable all squared. Okay, so we would like to get rid of this extra square to perform the integration in an easy way because this this term is coupling my integration variables. Okay, so do you know how to get rid of a, of a square in an exponential? 
and reduce it to a first order term. Sorry? Hmm. Okay. Which, in essence, is what? Okay. So, so in essence, uh, what we can uh, do is introduce a Gaussian uh, identity So if you have the exponential of something square, of this gamma square, you can rewrite it as an exponential of gamma, or just gamma. So you, you lower the degree from 2 to 1. The price to pay is that you need to integrate over an extra integration variable q. Okay. It's nice. We have, we have a, a square, an exponential of a square in here. We can reduce it as to an exponential of a degree one term, which will allow us to carry out the y integration. The only uh, price to pay is that there will be one extra integration over the variable q. But we are going for, from an n-fold integration to a single integration. That's better, right? Maybe not. You don't appreciate. OK, but I will use it anyway. Good. So we use this identity with gamma equal to summation over i, y, i square, and alpha equal to 2n. Because if alpha is equal to 2n, this object becomes 8n, which is exactly this, this term here. So, okay, we use this, uh, this identity. So the annealed partition function becomes the integral over dq, which is just a single integration variable, right? Of what? Of exponential minus alpha q square, but alpha is 2n, so minus 2n q square, right? And then you, we have i gamma q, but gamma is integrated because it's, it's a function of dy's. So what we, we have to put in here is the integral over dy of what? Of exponential minus i over 2 lambda epsilon summation over i y i square plus i q summation over i y i square. So now, the, the square here has disappeared. The square has disappeared. The price to pay is that we have an extra integration variable over q. But now, now you should be happy, right? Because we know how to, how to do this integral. This is just n copies of a single integral, right? It is the exponential of a sum of integration variables that appear in a factorized way. Okay. So what is this? Um, so what is this object uh, here? Just the integral over the n-fold integral here is just n copies of a single integral, which is integral between minus infinity and plus infinity of dy, just a single single integral, exponential of minus i over 2 lambda epsilon y square plus iq y square. Good. So now you solve this. Uh, you solve this uh, integral as an exercise. It is of the form exponential of alpha x square. 
between minus infinity and infinity. Okay, so it, sh it should be doable. And then we rewrite this object, which is the integral to the power n as exponential of n log of this integral. Okay, so if you do that, what you get for your annealed partition function, you get a single integral over Q of something that we can write in this form, exponential of minus n, then we have 2Q squared, which comes from, from here, minus 1 half the logarithm of 2 pi divided by epsilon plus i lambda minus 2q. So all you have to do is perform this, this simple integral and then rewrite the result to the power n as exponential to the power n times the logarithm of the result. And the exponential of n times logarithm of the result is this object here. Is the, is the, logic, is the logic clear? Good. Now you call this object as phi lambda of q. And now for large n, you tell me how to evaluate this object here. Yeah, so you have exponential minus n into some, some function, so the largest contribution to this integral will come to the neighborhood of points Q, where this object attains its minimum value. Okay? So if we do that, then we have that uh, the annealed approximation for this partition function will go as exponential minus n phi lambda of Q star, where Q star satisfies the stationarity condition of this action. So all we have to do is to, to compute the first derivative <coughs> evaluated in Q star of phi and set it equal to zero. So if we, if we do that, we get, uh, well, I did it uh, for you. You can, uh, you can check. So that's the, that's the saddle point condition. So for Q star, and then you take the derivative of this, uh, of this object with respect to Q. So this is the, the equation that you get. For Q star plus 1 over 2 Q star minus lambda epsilon. And then you solve, this is just a quadratic equation for Q star, which you solve. And, uh, and what you obtain is Q star is equal to 1 over 4 lambda epsilon plus minus root of lambda epsilon square minus 2. Okay? And here what you are, what you are witnessing here is what I call the birth, the birth of a semicircle. So there's, there's still some, some work to to do, we need to apply the Edwards-Jones formula, but in essence, the semicircle is hidden here already. So it's, it's, it's screaming hard to crop up. Yeah? Good, so now the only thing that we have to do is to apply the Edwards-Jones formula in, the, in this annealed approximation, so where we have taken the logarithm out of the integral. So I will remove uh, everything. Oh, 
Okay, so we apply now the Edwards Jones uh, formula in the annealed, uh, in the annealed uh, approximation. So we have that, and in the limit n to infinity, so we have that rho n to infinity of lambda should go as minus 2 over pi n, uh, the limit epsilon to 0 plus, the imaginary part of the derivative with respect to lambda of now what? We had the average over log of z, and now we're just taking the log of z annealed, right? So we take log of z annealed of lambda. And now we know that the logarithm of z annealed of lambda will go for large n as exponential minus n into a certain function, okay? Bingo. So here we need to put exponential of minus n into phi lambda of q star, right? Then you have the logarithm of the exponential, we can kill, we can kill them both, and then we will have a factor minus n and the factor minus n which will cancel out. So we will get a, a, a nice large n limit. So if we do that, we still, we will have a factor of two which is still which is still there, a factor of pi, and then we have the limit epsilon to zero plus of the imaginary part of the derivative with respect to lambda of phi lambda of q star. Where phi lambda is this one, and we need to evaluate it in, in q star. Do we agree? Now, the derivative with respect of, to lambda of q, uh, sorry, of phi lambda of q star will be, in general, using the chain rule, will be the first derivative of q star with respect to lambda times the derivative with respect to q of phi lambda of q evaluated in q star plus the derivative with respect to lambda of phi lambda of q, the explicit derivative evaluated at q equal to q star. Okay. And now, this object is equal to zero because we are at the stationarity condition. So all we have to do is to take the derivative with respect to lambda of phi lambda of q explicitly. So not through any dependence of q star on lambda. So what we have to compute is the derivative with respect to lambda of the only part of phi which depends on lambda explicitly, which is this one. So uh, of, let's say, one half, the logarithm of epsilon plus i lambda minus 2q, where I took the uh, minus away. So I put, I put this one in, uh, in the numerator. Uh, all this evaluated for q equal to q star. So if you take this uh, derivative, you get 1 half i over epsilon plus i lambda minus 2q evaluated for q equal to q star. And now we, we have q star here. So we can just plug it in, in here, and what we get is 1 over 2 lambda epsilon minus, okay, 4q star. Yeah, this was an extra step that I was taking. Well, this is 1 over lambda epsilon minus plus root of lambda epsilon square minus 2. So I'm taking the derivative with respect to lambda of the only bit of phi which depends explicitly on lambda, uh, on lambda. so not through q star, okay? Because we are at a stationary point, so the first bit is equal to zero. Now we are taking this, this derivative and we evaluate the derivative at q equal to q star. And if we do that, we obtain this object here. And now it's just a matter of computing Uh, 
of computing this object here. So rho n to infinity of lambda is 2 over pi limit epsilon to 0 plus of the imaginary part. So we have taken the derivative and we obtained this object here. So the imaginary part, we only need to extract the imaginary part of this object, taking into account that lambda epsilon is lambda minus i epsilon. So we can rationalize the, this denominator, and we get lambda epsilon plus minus root of lambda epsilon squared minus 2, the imaginary part. So this goes upstairs with the, with the sign change, and there is a factor of 2 that cancels this object here. So this 1 over pi limit epsilon to 0 plus. Okay. Now I, I let you carve out this, the imaginary part of this object using the fact that root of a plus ib is p plus iq, where p is, we use this identity several times, root of a squared plus b squared plus a, and q is sine of b over root 2, root of root a2 plus b squared minus a. So if you carry out this uh, imaginary part of this object here, what you get is precisely 1 over pi root of 2 minus lambda square if modulus of lambda is smaller than root 2 and 0 uh, otherwise. So even, even using this, uh, this crude uh, approximation of, ki of kicking the logarithm uh, outside, at least for a fully connected model like, like the GOE, we managed, using the Edward Jones with this approximation, to carve out the exact result that we know is the, is the, is the semicircle. Okay. Of course, this, this might be an accident. It might be non-convincing. Non so in the, in the next uh, lecture, I wanted to redo this, this calculation, but using the quenched, uh, so using the exact formula in connection with the replica, um, replica trick. Okay. And again, we will, after a much longer calculation, we will land on the, on the semicircle. OK? So I think I'm going to get a shower. <laughs> I'm, I'm done. I'm done for today. <laughs>